Good morning. Welcome to the 1003 service at the Union Church of South Foxborough. Welcome to all of you who are here. And welcome to all of you who are watching on our live stream. There's people in various states watching, Vermont, Virginia, and a lot of people in our local area who are watching. So welcome to every single one of you. I'll open us with a word of prayer and then share a couple announcements with you. Heavenly Father, thank you that we may gather in this place today. Thank you for your great love given to us through your Son, whose birth we have marked through the month of December. Thank you that he came out of love for us. Point our attention, we pray today, to you, to your truth for our, each of our lives, and receive our worship and our gratitude for all the blessings you've given us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. A couple of announcements to share with you. I don't know if I'm the only one coming, but next Saturday is our Jesus Revolution movie night. Movie night. If, you, if you've already seen it, come anyway. If you haven't seen it, it's a movie about revival that shook America. Uh, like 50 years ago, but we also had a little revival in America in 2023. So come next Saturday. It's church family time together. It is at 6.30 p.m. And then as a follow-up to that, on Sunday morning between the two services, we're going to be doing a time together um, around a little program called Tough Questions. And it tackled some tough questions that people will ask about the Christian faith, about the Bible, and helps us to share our faith and why we believe what we believe with others and deepen our own understanding. So Jesus Revolution, Saturday night, 6.30, followed by tough questions at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, and you're invited. And also Wednesday night Bible study is back on this week. January 3rd at 7 p.m. on Zoom or in person. You're invited to that, too. I think that's all our announcements. There's no Advent reading. See, now that Advent's over, I remember the Advent reading. That's the way it works. Shall we stand and worship the Lord together?
I like the lyric, you stepped into my Egypt and took me by the hand and marched me out in freedom into the promised land. Some of us grew up in church, and if so, we're blessed if we grew up being taught these things. And we, some people never have a moment that they remember that they turned to God and their life changed. It was just always that way. That, that, that story is a blessed story, but for many others, there was an Egypt. There was an Egypt that God stepped into. Maybe it was spiritual unawareness. We, we weren't taught these things. We didn't grow up in that way. Or maybe it was a problem in our life, or it was addiction, or whatever it might be. God, whatever our story is, God has stepped in and taken us by the hand and walked us to freedom, whatever our story is, if we know Christ as our Savior. We have some ongoing prayer requests, many ongoing prayer requests. We have um, a couple new prayer requests. We had prayed for Marcus's Aunt Noni down in Texas for quite some time, and he compassionately and selflessly went down and helped take care of her. Were you there for three weeks? About three weeks he was down there. Aunt Noni has passed away. So we can pray for Marcus and his Texas family particularly. We have, um, I have an update on my phone right now. We're gonna pray for the Keene family who recently had born to them baby Levi and they have had sickness go through the family and uh, this week was rough and Alana just texted me to say that little Levi has been sick but he's okay now. We're gonna pray for the Keene family. Those babies are so important and their little immune systems aren't necessarily ready for a lot so we will pray for them and for other ongoing prayer requests Psalm 36 says in part, beginning at verse 5, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, and he doesn't mean Blue Hill, the mighty mountains of your righteousness. Your justice is like the great deep. His love, his justice, his faithfulness, his righteousness are unmeasurable. The psalmist is saying, O Lord, you preserve both man and beast, man and animal. You preserve how priceless is your unfailing love. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we do not live in a blind universe though some mistakenly think we do we live in a universe we live on earth we live within history we live our personal life as targets of your love and your faithfulness your righteousness is beyond our understanding you've never thought a thing that was not true you've never spoken anything but truth your every motivation is pure in holiness. Your justice, when it finally is all given out, will be perfect in all of your thoughts and all of your actions and all of your decisions. And Father, you preserve man and beast. Our heart beats because you will it. Our next breath is given by you, by your choice and your sustenance. How priceless is your unfailing love in each of our lives. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you care for us as individuals. Thank you that the burdens we face, we never face alone. We can always look to you and always find you present, you caring for us. For you love us. Your love reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Father, we do pray with Marcus for his family in Texas as they lose a beloved aunt. We pray that you would grant them comfort and 
Marcus as well, comfort and peace, and all his family with this loss. Grant them your blessing and your presence and your love. We pray, Heavenly Father, for little Levi and his family who've had illness for several weeks now. Protect them, we pray, from further infection. Stabilize their health. Grant them blessing and wellness, we would pray. Father, I pray for a family friend, Mary, who has been in rehab for quite some time and had repeated health issues and is discouraged and has endured losses very personal to her. We pray that you might bless and comfort and strengthen her in mind and in body and in emotion and grant her great comfort, we pray, this very day. We pray, Heavenly Father, continually for others who are ongoing prayer requests for Stacy Barton's mother-in-law, that you might bless her and continue to watch over her during this difficult time. For Liga's mother, mother Velta, who is having tests this very week, we pray that these tests would be revealing that she doesn't need rigorous treatment. Grant in your mercy, we pray this. We continue to pray for other dear children, for Micah, having acute illness, continue to grant him wellness and healing. We would pray for little Ivy with heart issues, that you would bless her and you would provide for her and care for her. We pray for a little three-year-old named Charlie who is in need of your touch as she recovers from recent two surgeries. Continue to grant her wellness and healing. And Father, we remember a little boy named Michael. We cannot imagine having a child with cancer. But Father, we pray that his chemotherapy, as he goes through this second round, would grant him wellness, and he would be free the rest of his life, and you would bless him. Father, we have others in need of your continual sustaining. We pray for George Sirikis. Thank you that he's here. Continue to bless him. Thank you that he's feeling well. May this new treatment he is undergoing be absolutely effective for his health and well-being. We pray for Earl this morning with physical pain and difficulties that he's enduring, our senior member. Grant in your mercy comfort to him also. Father, there are many, many others on our prayer list, some who have had losses even in, even in the last few days. Father, bless, comfort, grant peace, grant comfort that only you can. And Father, work in the hearts and lives of those who are on our list, who we steadfastly hold before you for blessing. Father, we hold our nation before you and the new year before you. We are a nation in need of your touch. We are a nation in need of renewal. May it come in 2024. And Father, we know that every year brings changes. Every year brings challenges. We hold it before you. We hold our personal future and our nation's future before you and pray that you would so work that your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven in our lives in our country. Father, may we be your faithful stewards and servants of all you have given us. And Father, we worship you today by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, whose Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So this morning, if you'd like to follow along, we're going to be looking at... Luke chapter 2, Luke 
chapter 2, verses 21 through 40. The bulletin may say Matthew. We've been in Matthew since September. My poor wife who does the bulletin. If you're one of those people that notices bulletin errors, we noticed it, but I've been in Matthew for so long, she had Matthew on her mind, but we are in Luke chapter 2 to finish a part of the story, the narrative of the birth of Jesus that Luke records, that who, which Matthew does not. So we're in Luke chapter 2, page 725. In the Bible, it looks like this, page 725. And if you're using your phone, it's Luke chapter 2. And in a moment, we'll look at verses 21 through 40. Hey, Fran and I, Fran, our beloved deacon, and I once went for a visit to Harrington House to visit someone in our church family who was uh, getting rehabilitation there, and we met his very interesting roommate. His roommate was interesting for a couple reasons. One was, the day we met him, he was 106, 364 days old, 106, 364 days old. He was there because he had fallen in his apartment and broken his hip, and he was actively working with physical therapy with his walker. He said to us, I want to be back in my apartment very soon. We said, what is your name? He said, Fred Blizzard. You can Google him. Fred Blizzard, B-L-I-Z-A-R-D, not Blizzard. And Fran and I, when he was very pointed about that, blizzard, not blizzard. And Fran and I, when we left, couldn't help but have a chuckle over at that age, that poor man had probably been saying for over a hundred years, it's blizzard, not blizzard. And the very next day, Mr. Blizzard was on television celebrating his 107th birthday there at Harrington House. And he was on television because they said he is the oldest man in the state of Massachusetts. That was fun to meet him. Joseph and Mary, as we finish up the birth story of Jesus, Joseph and Mary, Joseph and Mary may have met the oldest Israelite Unexpectedly also, we'll get into that in a moment, one of the very unusual visitors in the story of the birth of baby Jesus. And as we've gone through this, this is the fifth week now, we've been talking about the birth of Jesus. His birth event, series of events really, was a strange mixture of the glory of heaven and earthly humiliation or embarrassment the glory part is the birth of Jesus was announced centuries ahead. Over 300 clues were given by the prophets beginning at Genesis 3, verse 15, and all the way through Isaiah and Micah and Zechariah and uh, Jeremiah and so on, all gave clues so that we could identify who he is. My birth wasn't announced for centuries ahead. I doubt anyone else's in all of history was. It was marked by a celestial star in the sky that drew the Magi who came all the way from the east. The night he was born, if we read the narrative, a choir of angels sang overhead and some shepherds scurried into town to visit the newborn king. The Magi arrived later from Iraq we think, likely. They traveled some 700 miles drawn by that star, their understanding of prophecy, and they were the opposite of the shepherds who were very poor. The, the magi were wealthy to have traveled all that way. And you'll recall also that King Herod, the king of the Judean province of the Roman Empire, became very upset by the news that another king out of his control and family, had been born in his kingdom. So the whole Judean province, the area around Jerusalem, was stirred up by the news of the newborn king. That's all the glorious part, the public part. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus was conceived in the body of a single woman. She evidently married Joseph during the pregnancy because... He was told to by the angel, 
but she was a virgin at his conception, married a poor carpenter, Joseph, Mary did, who was so poor they likely didn't have trouble necessarily finding a room. They just plain couldn't afford a motel room for the birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So he's born in likely a cave or a barn and laid in an animal's food trough as his first crib. So the contrast of heavenly glory and dignity is mixed in with a type of earthly embarrassment that perhaps many people go through. If you were born and had a stepdad and the gas oven was opened and turned on so the heat of the oven could heat the kitchen, that's the type of situation Jesus was born into a lowly carpenter from a rundown neighborhood called Nazareth is where he went to live. And Danny has kindly agreed to read for us Luke chapter 2, 21 through 40. Good morning. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was walking, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at, the very, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Thank you, Danny, for reading the passage for us. So Joseph and Mary are devout Jews. They are living according to the teaching of the law of Moses. And 40 days after the birth of Jesus, verse 22, they travel up to Jerusalem. It was during this time, during that 40-day period, that the Magi came and went. It is just after the presentation in the temple in Jerusalem, according to the timeline, if you combine Matthew and Luke, that he's told, uh, Joseph is told in a dream by an angel or by God to take the child and flee to Egypt where he will be safe. So Joseph and Mary, following the law of Moses, take Jesus up to Jerusalem to present the firstborn male of their family uh, to the Lord, the Lord being presented to the Lord. And notice what their offering is in the temple. They notably offer an offering of pigeons or birds, 
Leviticus 12, verse 8 had explained that if you couldn't afford a better offering, a lamb, for instance, if you were a poor person, you were allowed to offer something lesser like a grain offering or a, or a bird offering. And so Joseph and Mary, for all the fulfillment of prophecy and all the announcements of the prophets and all the singing of the angels, the reality is they're not wealthy, they're quite poor. So they offer what they can afford. And strangely in the temple, they have two unexpected visitors, both of whom are advanced in years. And Simeon comes first and gives a powerful two-part declaration about this baby boy that Mary is holding in her arms. And the first thing he makes clear is, and he has a prophetic understanding, God has spoken to him, and he's declaring what he has been told, this holy infant... This child right there in the temple is the universal savior for all people. My eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon is praying to God. My eyes have seen your salvation pointing to Jesus. This is the savior which you have prepared before all people. God hasn't done anything in secret. It's been declared for centuries. It's been told he'd be born in Bethlehem. It's been told he'd be of the line of David. He would be a Jewish male, etc. And publicly from birth, this is all known about him. And Simeon goes on then to use the phrase, a light for the Gentiles. And it's a somewhat stunning thing that in the year we believe Jesus was born in 4 BC, we can point to that due to Luke's timing as a historian, in 4 BC, Simeon sees Jesus emerging from the Jews and Israel, but as a savior, not just for the Jewish people, but for all people everywhere, including the Gentiles. A radical, surprising thing for Simeon to be saying at the time standing in the temple in Jerusalem. In first century Jerusalem, this was borderline, it was shocking and borderline blasphemous to say the circle of salvation could possibly include the Gentiles and even enemies of Israel, of the Jewish people. A, a practicing Jew in the first century had a lot of people to be afraid of, including the Romans who were overseeing their land as Gentile oppressors. But Simeon nevertheless declares, this baby is for all people in all places, a light to the Gentiles. Now the minor prophets, that little group of books after the major prophets and before the New Testament, those books, Malachi, Habakkuk, Nahum, Obadiah, and so on, had foretold that salvation would be for the Gentiles also. But to publicly declare this in a standing in the temple was a rash, bold thing for Simeon to do. But notice that Simeon, in declaring Jesus to be the one Savior meant for all people in all places, of every ethnicity, every tribe, every nation, he's declaring God's truth, even if it isn't the religious teaching of the time in which he lives. And as a sub-point, as a sub-thing to think about, God's truth isn't always the religious teaching of a given place and time. And Simeon is declaring God's truth about Jesus. He is the Savior for all people everywhere, Jew and Gentile in any place, in any century. Whoever looks to him by faith will be rescued. A.W. Tozer said, if you see all the Christians running one way, run the opposite. Run the opposite. Because God's truth and what God actually said is not necessarily the same as where 
God's people think they ought to be going or the religious teaching of a given day and we're to be very careful to hear what God actually said and follow the right people and not the wrong teaching and Simeon here is the right person giving the right word that this infant, this Jesus, is the universal savior for all people. In this case, he's speaking on behalf of God who has inspired him to say, my son has come from all eternity and he is the savior of the world. He's not a fine religious teacher. He's not that. He's not one of many prophets that you can listen to. He's not that. He's not one of a lot of wannabe messiahs all through history. He's not that. He's the one for all people, in all places, for all time. Isaiah 52 verse 10 said, the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God, foretelling the modern day missionary movement where the gospel is spreading all around the world by technology too. Isaiah 42 verse 6 said, a light to the nations. The Messiah would be a light to the nations, the Jew and the Gentile, for all people everywhere, the one for all people to turn to and humble our heart before and repent before. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, are the apostles, are hauled in by the religious leaders and question about what they're teaching and about Jesus. And in part, Peter boldly looks at them and says, of Jesus, there is no other name given among men by whom we might be saved. And what he said then is the declaration of the church today, and what Simeon said is the declaration of the church for all time. This infant Jesus here in the temple is the universal savior for all people who will humble themselves and look to him. And Simeon seems to be in a mood to speak boldly because the next point that he makes is in verses 35 and 36. All humanity will one day be judged by this baby. All humanity will one day give an accounting before this child. He says the child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that it will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. He is appointed to the rise and fall of many. The rise of many are those who trust in him, who by the power of his resurrection will rise in faith to the kingdom of heaven. But he was also would be a sign to be opposed Jesus himself opposed, and there were many who will fall before him, not in, hum in humbling our hearts or in reverence before him, but in opposition to him. And having opposed him, they will one day, when he judges the world, fall before him. Jesus made very exclusive statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 14, verse 6. Simeon is, for, Simeon is foretelling that those who remain proud, who rationalize away why this cannot be true, why he is not the true Savior, why there is not a triune God, why I have no need to repent before him, those will fall before him those who remain proud, but those who humble our hearts, like the publican who came up to the temple to pray in a story Jesus told and beat his chest and said, Lord, I am a sinner, have mercy on me, will find satisfaction in cleansing and in forgiveness of sin. Several years ago, for for. For several years, it was my daughter and I living at home. I was a single dad, and my other daughter, who was older, would kind of come and go. And at the time I'm thinking of, she was living at home with us. And this particular day, I was up taking a shower, and in the upstairs, I have a tub. We have a tub for a shower. 
And when I went to get out of the shower, I sort of tripped or I slipped or something, and I grabbed the shower curtain. There's a good source of support, right? And I pulled the whole shower rod down, and it fell with a big clatter, and I caught myself on my hands, and I was laughing. And I got dressed, and I came downstairs to find my daughter sitting, waiting for me. And they said, Dad, we need to have a talk with you. Sh falling in the shower is very dangerous. It might be time for a safer way for you to live, a, a safer living situation. We're blessed if we get to that day. Simeon was saying, don't fall. Don't fall before Jesus in judgment. He is the one who will judge humanity. John, in the book of Revelation, describes the great white throne and him who sat upon it and all humanity spread out before him. Stay safe, trusting in him. One day we will all give an accounting before him. Simeon is making bold declarations. This infant, this Jesus, is the one savior for all people in all places, the name given under heaven by which we may be rescued. Furthermore, one day he will be the one who evaluates every human according to whether he is in our heart and if he is, we pass through and never face judgment. But then Anna also enters the courtyard, and she's a very unusual woman. She's the only woman in the pages of scripture who actually has a room in the temple. Very unusual for anyone to live in the temple in Jerusalem. But Anna evidently lives right in the temple or right close to the temple. And the NIV that we have in our chairs and that Danny read for us says she was a widow to the age of 84. Many of the manuscripts actually say she was married for seven years with her husband and then was a widow for 84 further years. If so, she was extremely old like Mr. Blizzard. But in any event, she's of great age in that century and in that time, and she lives in the temple where we're told she was fasting and praying for her people continuously. She's a prophet, we're told. That means she's a teacher of the faith. Again, very unusual for a woman to be teaching in the temple. <clears throat> and here Anna makes a declaration as well. We're told that she speaks of Jesus to all who were present and in that place. What should we do? What are we as followers of Christ to do? We're to speak of him to others. We're to be willing to share our faith with others. She gave thanks to God, the text says, and continued to speak to him, pass to pass, our favorite Greek word, all of those who were looking for redemption. She joined Simeon in declaring Jesus is the Messiah by divine revelation. There are the two witnesses required by the law of Moses. And she speaks of him to all who are present. I seem to be on a roll of very old people today. And I used to go down to Pennsylvania and visit my Mennonite mom, Oma. She lived to be 100 years old herself. And she had this little room. You'd walk in this room, and her bed would be there, and there'd be a bathroom in on the left. And over the bed was her recliner where she would sit. And there by the window, she had a table with everything valuable right where she could reach it. There was her Bible. There were some books on the geography of Israel. There was her Bible dictionary, because even after reading the book for a century, she was still studying it. There were DVDs of her favorite biblical teachers so she could have a nurse pop them in and she could watch them. It was like walking into a chapel or maybe a Bible professor's office. And Oma would say to me, I don't understand Christians. I don't understand Christians. Most people behave as though their faith is totally private. She said, wherever we go, we should be telling others about him. We should be speaking of him. She said, 
Do we believe he's salvation and life and the most important thing anyone could ever hear? Why do we keep him private? Why are we not speaking of him? That's what Anna did, this unusual old lady of either 84 or 100 years old, whatever she was, living in the temple. She was willing to stand up and speak and say this. I join Simeon in declaring, this is the Savior. This is the one who is life. And she spoke, spoke pass to all who were present and all who were looking for redemption in Israel. So this baby, by declaration of Simeon, is the universal savior for all humanity, every language, every people group, every individual. He is presented by the one true God to all of humanity to humble our hearts before and say, Lord, I'm, I'm fallen, I'm sinful, I need your forgiveness, I need your help, I need you to change my heart and my life. And in fact, according to Simeon, with the motion seconded by Anna, this Jesus will one day judge all of humanity. We will stand before him and give an accounting. And that's why Anna, with all her wisdom, all her holiness, an unusual person, set aside greater perhaps than any man living spiritually, which is why she was where she was, speaks up and says, this is who he is. He's all that. He's the hope of the world. Maybe this week we can get up our courage and speak of him to one other person who comes across our path. Heavenly Father, thank you for Simeon. Thank you for the insight you gave to him about Jesus to confirm our faith and change our lives. Because if he's the savior for all people, he's the savior for each of us. And Father, thank you for Anna who reminds us to speak publicly, to not be afraid, to mention our belief and who he is and the hope that he offers. May we be people in 2024 who carry your message out of love for others. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
I love Ollie, I believe, in that song. I had to take a picture. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars on your hand. And I love the line, the God of creation knows me by name. He knows your name. He sent his son. He's the universal savior for all people, which means us. He will judge the world. And we can share that, those truths and the hope that he gives us with others. And whatever is coming in 2024, and none of us know, we can trust him and walk with him. And he will never leave us because he is faithful yesterday, today, and always. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us on live stream wherever you are. We're glad to have you. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours in abundance. Amen.